On the 8th of July, 2021, Amsterdam city government adopted one of the most ambitious environmental visions for a city and the plans to achieve it in history. The Dutch government features one central government divided over 12 provinces. Beneath them are hundreds of individual municipalities. Municipalities can range from cities to towns and they form a legislative body with a plural executive. Unlike many other countries, Burgemeesters, mayors, are not elected in the Dutch system, but selected, and they form a pseudo-executive branch with wethouders who are appointed by the gemeenteraad, the legislative body. In 2021, the Umgevingsvisie, roughly translating into environmental vision, was passed. A somewhat vague document by Dutch standards, it still sets out a detailed plan for how the city can and will develop over the next couple of decades. Amsterdam is separated into the following boroughs. The center being the most historically famous for its canals, red light district, and drunk British tourists. To balance the increasing pressure on the center, the city has focused in on making the other boroughs more attractive in themselves. In New West, South Oost, and Noord, Amsterdam's largest transformations are taking place. Noord, located across the Ai, has been seen as historically separate, the borough inconvenient to travel to, requiring either travel by ferry and car. But in 2018, a metro connection made Noort a focus point for urban development in the city, attracting investment and gentrification. But the metro line and existing ferry networks are not enough to weather the increasing demand for public transportation from the growing city population, especially when the city has also committed to not increasing car traffic. And to solve this, the city has planned for the construction of additional bridges, located at the center and on two opposing flanks reducing the bottlenecks on transportation and making Noort a more desirable place to live. In all three boroughs, the city is planning on investing massively in constructing higher dense areas in order to create sub-centers within the overall city. In all three, attempts at producing more mixed residential and business zoning so that the city can attract more middle-class families. These high-density areas are also generally located close to transportation nodes, and the city will also attempt to add regional hubs for cars located near stations, extending the metro network, reducing the maximum car speed, and adding additional bike paths on the already existing network. But all of these changes are a reflection of one major goal. Increase the density across the entire city, converting sections of the city into different islands of density, which pushes the focus outside the historic center. And this is where a seeming contradiction emerges. How do you increase houses while also trying to increase the city's overall green space? Like a deformed hand, one of Amsterdam's most unique features are its green wedges, large areas of green landscape that tunnel their way into the city, providing, in theory, readily available access to green space for everyone. In the early 1900s, European city planners investigated and debated how the growth of a city could be balanced with maintaining green spaces and reducing sprawl, and there were many different ideas on how this could be achieved. Entire belts of green surrounding entire cities, implemented in large part in England, or wedges, which could also vary significantly in how they were designed. The Netherlands was one of the European countries that pioneered the use of green wedges, and their connection to Amsterdam can be traced back to the 1920s, to a vision by Hendrik Weidevelt, a Dutch graphic designer and architect, who proposed that the city should follow a green wedge design in his works Chaos and Order, dividing the outside of Amsterdam into different equal wedges, which would constrain chaos into clearly delineated order. He also made elaborate plans for a people's theater, which would be situated in Vondelpark near Amsterdam's main cultural institutions, and represent a symbol of fertility, welcoming the mass of people designed as if they were small seeds that aspire to reach the inside of the theater space, a real and true maternal womb. It wasn't until around a decade later, though, that a young architect, Cornelis van Eesteren, would actually end up making the green wedges a reality for the city. Van Eesteren worked for Amsterdam's town planning department for over 30 years, as well as serving as the chairman of CM, the International Congress of Modern Architecture, but in a more complicated French the organization that helped influence the modernist principles in architecture that inspired the Belmer three decades later, which also deserves a video of its own. Influenced behind the ideas of creating a functional city, Van Eesteren produced the Amsterdam Extension Plan in the 1930s, which introduced a network of green wedges that would start in Amsterdam and then widen themselves out into the green heart of the Netherlands. 
a large green area that is sizing itself up to become one of the most important sections of the country, maybe even Europe in its entirety, over the coming decades. Many on the outside look at Amsterdam in isolation, a single city with a rich history that stands on its own. But this is wrong. That, um, we in Nederland uh, uns, uh, realiseren that Amsterdam, uh, Rotterdam, Den Haag and Utrecht are one city. With the het, uh, het, het Groene Hart, there is a little bit of a small Central Park. And we have to do these four cities to do the work to be a New York of the 21st, 22nd century. Amsterdam is part of a much larger whole, the Randstad one of the most overlooked metropolitan regions on Earth, the fourth largest in Europe only after London, Paris, and the Rhine. It's an urban cluster of the Netherlands' most economically valuable cities, Amsterdam, Den Haag, Rotterdam, and Utrecht, including many other important municipalities and townships. And where many cities across Europe stand individually, pressured to expand with little constraint outwards, the Randstad is unique for being a cluster of cities individually expanding within incredibly close proximity, with the option to travel to multiple cities within the cluster in under two hours using public transport. The Randstad area, home to nearly half of the country's population, mirrors Amsterdam's individual problems, a growing pressure for new housing while also maintaining high quality green space. The Randstad has put increasing attention on how the Groene Hart should be regulated and the landscape preserved, both for the residents living there and also as a vital green space for the people living on the outside of it. Concern for this development, which will be under increasing scrutiny over the next few decades, has practically locked expansion into the green wedges, as the Amsterdam city government also has to manage negotiating scarce public land with other municipalities. Instead, they will continue to focus on producing the high-density areas in the places already existing between each wedge and on their borders, while attempting to make the wedges more attractive for the pedestrians living between them. One of the ways of doing this is by targeting the highways that border them, which can constrain access. By converting business areas into mixed residential zoning, which brings in a larger amount of city government revenue, the city government can then gather a war chest that can be used to redevelop the highways so they can provide more green space and or better access to it. This is happening alongside millions in investment for more green spaces in the city overall. And although the plans are relatively vague on how this will be achieved, it's clear that the goals are to link green spaces in the city, creating an interconnected network, while also making street level changes directly. This means installing green roofs on the homes that can handle it, and replacing tiles on sidewalks, which for some reason the Dutch are obsessed with it. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. But the green is also necessary to solve a more nefarious problem. Rain. Amsterdam has, and will continue, to see more extreme weather which contributes to flooding and to city damage. A way to solve this is by individually equipping homes that together can solve the larger problem. In front of old or new buildings, you can make space for gardens with water-hungry plants by getting rid of street tiling. Then create subtle cuts in concrete, a design feature so simple that it's genius, connect the drains and then rig it so that if the water supply is too much for the dirt plant sponge, it can then filter through the larger city drain and only then impact the water network. Do this with enough homes and we might have a chance for handling extreme weather events. The Netherlands is a good country, and plenty of people know that the Dutch are good at water, but much less know why the Dutch are also so good at being so critical. And that's because, to maintain the system that would defend them against walls of death, the Dutch would require a massive coordinated effort. If you don't critique your neighbor's dike building abilities, you die. And although history is always difficult to draw trend lines through, the culture that had to be developed to maintain the system has been connected with the consensus structure that takes place in all facets of Dutch society, including, of course, the development of Amsterdam. And so, if you're interested in the future of this city, make sure you call up the Gemeente and piss off the Wethouders, because not only is that in your right, but they're also getting paid way too much not to be criticized. And at the end of the day, what Amsterdam's plans envision can be very different from what is possible. The corona crisis required a large amount of the city's budget, and the most recently chosen coalition of D66 PvdA and GroenLinks has to make some very difficult decisions. They can reduce their ambitions by failing to deliver on their infrastructure plans, or they can attempt to still get close to reaching their goals by making the locals foot the bill. But what makes Amsterdam one of the most beautiful cities on earth, a hill I'll die on, is that it knows how to iterate and learn. And so whether everything in the plan comes to be is a separate matter. 
but whether this city has the best chance to actually lay down an ambitious plan and vision for the future and come close to actually realizing it, that's without question. Before you click off, I want to say that I'm giving two books away, and all you need to do is be subscribed to this newsletter on Twitter. One is in Dutch and on Amsterdam's Algemene Breidingsplan, it's just so you know, and the other is in English on the history of green wedges. I also wanted to say thank you to Jesse Wies and Dr. Rocco, as well as any additional supporters who increase my ability to take risks while producing European content. The videos are a constant work in progress, and they aren't at all the quality that I'd like them to be. I'd like to do so, so much more in terms of 3D, and also doing that while covering undersupplied European stories. So, if you want to be able to help me do that, know that any support is incredibly appreciated.